I remember, I remember, I think it was the first time this ever happened. I was a teenager, I think, and I was at this Mexican restaurant and I remember I ordered, I'll typically go for the burrito or some tacos or something, whatever, whatever I ordered, you get the side, right? And the, the side, uh, you typically go beans and rice, you know? Well, I remember this waitress came up and she was nice and everything, but she became a very questionable person by my estimation when she looked at me and she said something that I never thought I would hear a waitress say at a Mexican restaurant. And she said this, she said, would you like beans or rice with your, with your meal? And I thought to myself, beans or rice? <laughs> It's a stupid example, but they ought not be separated. They're meant to go together. That's how God intended it. Listen, we talk about Jesus Christ and him crucified, but God forbid we don't with it, hand in hand together with Jesus Christ and him crucified. Always make mention of Jesus Christ risen again in glory. It's like beans and rice or peanut butter and jelly or whatever analogy floats your boat. And, and I, I remember probably four or five years ago now, I first had that realization that, man, we, we often talk about the cross and don't talk about the resurrection. The resurrection doesn't get as much press, you know? And, and it's not to... to take anything away from the power of the cross. My goodness, we just spent three weeks looking at the cross of Jesus Christ. You can't overemphasize that. The point isn't to take anything away from the cross. It is to elevate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I'm stoked after three weeks. And, and I've mentioned the resurrection because, again, the beans and rice thing. I, I couldn't help it the last few weeks. I, you have to, you know. And ever since I first had that realization, I've been trying to be intentional uh, to, to always include the resurrection when I talk about the cross from the pulpit and in life. But, but with that, let's, let's read. I just want to read with you the first 10 verses and then we'll, we'll dive in. There's, there's three things. Today we're going to cover the first 18 verses in John chapter 20. And, and there's three things I want to unpack with you from that text. But let's start uh, by simply reading verses 1 through 10. Now, it says, again, last, last time we left off and Jesus is verifiably dead. The executioners shoved the spear to make sure, you know, into Jesus' side to make sure that he is verified as dead. So we leave off with a verifiably dead, crucified, and buried Jesus. And now it says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And as, as we look at these things too, keep in mind all of the themes that we've been talking about through the entire Gospel of John. The entire Gospel of John has been leading to these two events, the, the crucifixion and resurrection. So when I think darkness, for example, I, I think of Nicodemus who came to Jesus when it was dark, when it was at night. And he was in the dark, and he was seeking truth. Anyways, you can, you can pull the thread in all kinds of ways. Look for these Easter eggs, yes? So Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went, proclaiming that he is risen. No. She went... To Simon Peter and the other disciples and the one whom Jesus loved, who is most likely John, basically nobody disagrees. Everybody uh, feels that it is safe to say that that is how John refers to himself in this gospel. So Peter and John and the disciples and, and, and Mary Magdalene says to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. On that initial and original Easter Sunday, she wasn't anticipating a risen Lord. She was expecting him to find him there dead in the tomb. 
And so when the stone was taken away, she immediately assumes and jumps to the conclusion that somebody must have stolen the body. Uh, grave robbery was a thing in those days. Uh, people would, would go and, and jack the body and take any of the possessions that may have been buried with the person. So she assumes that's what happened. And so, verse 3, Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. John says, I'm just going to throw this in there. I, I won the race. And stooping to look in, he, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he saw the linen clothes lying there, the, the grave wrappings, right? He saw them lying there, but he did not go in. And then verse 6 says, Simon Peter came. And traditionally, John was the youngest, or if not one of the youngest, perhaps the youngest of all of the disciples, and, and Peter would, would be older and huffing it to the tomb. So, so the older guy, Pete comes up breathing heavily, perhaps. But where John just stooped and looked in, as is his personality, Peter barges in, right? He went into the tomb and he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but fold, folded up and in a place by itself. Some suggest perhaps uh, just, just imagine the body of Jesus almost like evaporating or passing through the, the grave wrappings. You know, like they'd wrap up a mummy or something like that. They would, they would wrap these guys in these cloths. And uh, the idea is that it, it was lying there, not as if somebody had moved it or, or adjusted it, but as though it just kind of collapsed under the air when the body was gone. It's kind of mysterious. It's kind of interesting, but it, but it seems supernatural. But then, but then the, the head wrapping, it was neatly folded as if someone didn't need it anymore. Fold it and set it there. They look in and they, they see this situation. And then verse 8 says, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and believed. It clicks for him that Jesus is risen. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So he understands the fact of the resurrection, but he doesn't fully comprehend all of the meaning and, and how it ties into the scriptures. He, it just clicks for John there that... that Jesus rose. And then verse 10 says the disciples went back to their homes. So we'll, we'll, we'll pause right there. This whole scene takes place. John humbly refers to himself, not by name, but as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And then not so humbly says, I won the foot race. And then also, in, in a sense, I won the faith race. I, I was the first one to make it to the tomb. And I was the first human being on earth ever to understand that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Kind of cool. The first point I want to make from our text and from these first 10 verses this morning is because he lives, number one, investigate rationally. All three are going to be because he lives and then the point. So because he lives, number one, investigate rationally. As the saying goes, the creed goes, the, the words we speak on Easter, that he is risen. He is risen indeed. It's, it's, it's real. It's true. He is risen and he is risen indeed. Because he lives, because we're standing on solid ground, the church is very transparent, is very open. 
and the church from, from the apostles who themselves investigate the evidence in this text and in the coming texts. You know, we'll see, I mean, Thomas gets a bad rap for it, but, but he wants to see the wounds. He wants to put his, he wants to touch the wounds of Jesus. He, he wants to see for himself. The apostles were, were men and, and the early church was made up of people who, who didn't just exercise blind faith, like some put it. They were people who, who investigated these things, who looked into these things. They were rational about it. They were not irrational and radical. They were radical. But I would ask, how could you possibly expect a faith built on a foundation that isn't rational to endure through life's storms? Irrational positivity or, or nice thoughts will not see me through the storm. And the early church went through a radical storm of opposition and persecution. Many became martyrs. Many watched their, their loved ones, their, their, their spouse or their kids suffer and die for the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truthfulness of his resurrection. They were able to weather the storm because he lives, because their faith was built on reason. Oh, our faith goes beyond reason, but it doesn't go against reason. And we'll get into that in a second. But first, I just want to show you in this text how they are, are, are not just saying stuff about the resurrection. Their, their initial belief and, and the first understanding of the resurrection is built on reason and, and, and logic and, and seeing and, and thinking and concluding. There are three words in the first 10 verses for the word saw. Three Greek words that are all translated saw. The first word, I'm not going to try and pronounce the Greek for you this morning, um, but the first word saw is in verses 1 and 5. When Mary and Peter look and they saw the, the, the stone had been rolled away. That first Greek word for saw in verses 1 and 5 means to clearly see a material object. To clearly see a materi material object. It's the basic sense of sight. It's physically seeing something simply communicating that they looked and saw with their physical eyes. But then in verse 6, let's read verses 6 and 7. It says, Then Simon Peter came following him, following John, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. This, this second word for saw, it means to see and carefully examine, to contemplate and scrutinize. So first he just looks. Him and Mary, they, they, just, they just see it, right? And he starts running towards it, <laughs> you know. But then, if, if it is, in fact, the garden tomb, you can go and visit. The, there's two places that uh, traditionally people look at as, as the place where Jesus was buried. There's the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre uh, there in, in Israel, and there's also the garden tomb. And uh, I like to think it's the garden tomb, but uh, who, who can know for sure? But, but if it is the garden tomb, I, I've, I've walked into it. And it's kind of interesting. You, 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 I could see how they would stoop down because... Initially, there's the opening, right, in the little cave that's the tomb. And there's a, a rectangle area when you, when you first can kind of go and step down into the cave that is the tomb. And it was a viewing area. It was, it was an area where people could go and, and look on the body and, and 
grieve and, and mourn and, and do their thing. The second compartment or the second area in that tomb would have one, or in this case, in the garden tomb there that you can visit, there are two places, there are two almost like benches carved into the stone where you could lay a body. And, and there's a place carved out where you can walk in there and also kind of windows carved out that you can look through and, and see where the body would lay. So, so John, he, he, he stoops and he looks down into the place where the bodies would be. John, or Peter just barges in, right? And, and, and he goes. And, and now he's not just looking, just the physical act of seeing something. No, now he's carefully examining. He's contemplating and scrutinizing. What? The verse says he, he's, he's considering the, the burial wrappings that were wrapped around the body of Jesus. And, and he's noticing, this is weird. There's something peculiar about this. This isn't normal. This could not have been the work as Mary had supposed in the first part of the, the passage. This could not have been the work of grave robbers. First of all, grave robbers wouldn't have taken the, the, the wrappings off the body anyways. Why would they do that? One, the body would... would would stink and they would want to keep it covered up as much as they, they could, you know, over time. But, but also, they weren't free. Uh, there would be monetary value for those wrappings. And so they wouldn't, they wouldn't leave them there. And even if they did leave them there, they would probably be working in haste. They probably wouldn't leave them perfect, like, like as if the body was never touched, but something supernatural happened. Peter's looking at this. He's like, this is weird. This is different. This isn't a normal thing. This isn't a normal situation. He, he's carefully considering what he's looking at with, with the, the burial wrappings of Jesus and how they're positioned. And then the head wrappings aren't like the rest of the body. Like they just kind of went flat. But, but the, the head wrappings is like somebody neatly folded them and didn't need them anymore and set them there. Point being, his wheels are turning He's not just merely physically looking like in verse 1 and 5. Now John picks a different Greek word to say that Peter is carefully examining, scrutinizing, reasoning this peculiar situation before him. But then there's a third word for saw, and that's in verse 8. Let's read verses 8 through 10 again. It says, Then the other disciple, John, who had reached the tomb first, he won the foot race, also went in, and he saw and believed. He won the faith race. For yet they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And then they all went home. This word for saw in verse 8 means to understand and perceive the significance of. So first, they're just physically seeing then they're carefully examining and questioning this peculiar deal. But then the light bulb goes off. And so he adds once more that he won the foot race, but he chooses this Greek word for saw to say that he won the faith race. It clicks for him. He, under, he didn't understand everything yet. He would, he would understand the way it ties into all of Scripture as time goes on. But in that moment, it clicked and registered in his brain. He, he, he saw and understood. He, he was able to perceive that this, this means Jesus rose. <laughs> Peter's thinking, this is weird. And John's thinking, yeah. <gasps> this isn't that weird. This is the best news in the history of the universe. <gasps> the resurrection and the gospel of Jesus. And the movement of the church. It's not founded upon blind faith. And, and let me say this. This is not... This is barely scratching the surface of all of the evidence that exists for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is not the whole 
of the evidence and argument for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is just a, a little nugget in our text that we happen to be in as we're going through the Gospel of John and now we're here on Easter Sunday to simply make the point that he lives. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And, and when you carefully examine the burial wrappings and all of the events in history and, and, and I mean secular history and also biblical history as well. If you will, when you do, you'll discover the truthfulness and the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And I just wanted to make this point this morning because there was a point in time in my life where I really was struggling with a lot of different stuff and I needed to get to the bottom of this whole Christianity thing. Because it's worth so much. I mean, put it this way, if, if you were to get a, a letter in the mail, a very official looking letter from a law firm, and, and, and it said in the letter that you had a long lost relative, a, a second cousin twice removed Bob who passed away, but this guy Bob left you millions of dollars and now it's in your name. I think there's two things it's safe to say that would be going on within you. One, a, a great deal of skepticism, <laughs> right? I've never heard of a Bob. Uh, you know, who's this guy? What, what is the deal? It seems too good to be true. Lots of scams exist in the world today. But I said two things would be stirring in you. Not only would you be skeptical, I think it's safe to say that you would want to look into it. <laughs> right? Even if you might be skeptical, the letter did look official. And if it's true, it's worth so much. It's worth so much. I got to at least pull the thread. I got to at least look into it. The same is true with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when I was having this, this, this moment where I just needed to get to the bottom of everything, there were two questions I needed sufficient answers to. Is the resurrection true and trustworthy? And is the Bible true and reliable? It's Easter, though. We're talking about the resurrection. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, articulates, if you're wondering, well, well, millions of dollars, that's worth a lot. How much is it worth the truthfulness or falsehood of the resurrection? Paul articulates the answer to that question in 1 Corinthians 15. And ultimately, in 1 Corinthians 15, the answer is simply that if the resurrection is not true, if Jesus did not rise, if he remained dead, then all of Christianity is false and a hoax. And if you're taking notes, you can read it later. I won't for the sake of time, but that's 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. And in verses 12 through 19, he plays out the ramifications of Christianity being false if Jesus did not rise again. He says, the whole thing's a hoax and our preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain. The New Testament misrepresents God. We are still in our sins. Our loved ones who have died have perished and will never see them again. And he says, finally, we more than anyone else should be pitied. He's writing this saying, I've leveraged my entire life on the truthfulness of of the resurrection and gospel of Jesus Christ. I've, I've been whipped and beaten, scourged and shipwrecked and stoned and left for dead. And, and, and I abandoned all of my temporal gain for, for this heavenly reward. If this isn't true, someone tell me because I should be pitied more than anybody else. But then after listing all of those things, in verse 20, he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. So not only is he risen 
from the dead, and that's a fact, but also he's the first fruits, meaning we also will be raised together with him. That's the hope of our salvation. And, and therefore, we can conclude the inverse of all of the former is true in a beautiful and powerful way. The preaching of the apostles is not in vain. It's objective truth. Our faith is not in vain. We're, we're, we're saved through it by the grace of God. The New Testament does not misrepresent God. It's the glory of God revealed in Christ. We are not still in our sins who put our faith and trust in Jesus. We're perfectly forgiven and saved. And when our loved ones die in Christ, we are going to see them again in heaven. It's this beautiful, all-important truth. That's what it's worth. But for the sake of this message this morning, instead of going through a bunch of apologetics, which I thought about, I simply want to say, be like the apostles and be like all who were born of God after them, whose faith was strong enough to withstand a storm and investigate rationally. Employ reason, employ logic. One nugget I'll give you as you embark on your own investigation. Like I mentioned before, our faith goes beyond reason, but it doesn't go against it. Let me add this. It is foolish to disbelieve something simply because it exists outside of our present categories. Let me say that again. It's foolish to disbelieve something simply because it goes beyond or exists outside of our present categories. What do you mean? This is what I mean. I mean that if you were to go back to somebody not in 2024, but in 1924, and try and tell them about your phone, they would look at you like you were psycho, like you were wacko. Why? Because what I'm holding in my hand exists outside of the categories that limit the brain of somebody in 1924. If I were to try to tell somebody in 1924 that I could tell this rectangle to turn on my AC, they would look at me like I was insane. Even more insane, if I were to tell them that I could see somebody's face who is on the other side of the world and in real time have a conversation with them, it would be foolish for our friends in 1924 to disbelieve in a smartphone because it exists outside of their present categories. Does that make sense? Once upon a time, it was the common opinion in science that the human body could not withstand the force of speeds greater than 25 miles an hour. But you, you've proved that wrong on your way here this morning, friends. Just because something exists outside of your presently limited categories does not mean it should be rejected. Our faith goes beyond reason, yes, but it does not go against reason. In the modern science of our day, in the popular opinion of our day, to answer the question of origins and the question, uh, you know, how did the world begin? not only goes beyond reason, but it goes against it. How? Well, you think about what many people talk about, the, the Big Bang. To say that something comes from nothing in and of itself is a hurdle. But then to say that, that all of the energy and mass all of the potential for the universe was, was somehow compressed and stabilized in one point, perfectly at rest through all of eternity past. And then one random afternoon goes bang. It violates one of the basic laws of science, the law of inertia, which states that something at rest will remain at rest until or unless it is acted upon by an outside force. So though a bullet has the capacity to explode and project, it will remain in this balanced, stable state until or unless it is acted upon by the outside force of the trigger and the hammer. 
no matter what you believe, even in, in science, th this is the one miracle that scientists demand of you. It goes beyond reason. But to say that an eternal creator Who, who, who is the fountain and source of life, who exists in and of himself with nothing else needed to sustain, to say that he created the universe and specifically raised Christ from the dead, it, it contradicts no formal laws of science. It goes beyond reason, but it doesn't go against reason. So I'd encourage you to investigate. And when you investigate, investigate rationally. I feel like I can say that with much confidence because I did. And I was scared too, honestly. Because what if I, I found something that was troubling? I purposed in my heart to seek out not only scholars and, and, and good thinkers within the Christian faith to present the arguments for the resurrection, but I also started listening to what guys like Richard Dawkins or the leading atheists and, and secular thinkers, the opponents of Christianity, I wanted to hear what they had to say. I didn't want to hear a Christian set up a straw man and then tear it down with ease. I wanted to, I wanted to hear what, what, what they're saying. And I wanted to approach it objectively. And it was so thrilling and edifying and life-giving and sustaining for my life and faith in Jesus to do so and come out the other side more confident in the gospel and resurrection of Jesus Christ than ever before. And so I can tell you to investigate rationally with confidence because I know that this holds water. Secondly, though, not only, number one, because he lives, we can investigate rationally. Number two, because he lives, also believe boldly. Believe boldly. Verse 11 through 15. But, so, so the disciples go home. But, verse 11, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. She didn't know what was going on still. She was still in the dark. Remember, she came in the morning early. The verse, first couple of verses say, she came early while it was still at dark. It was dark outside and it was dark in her thinking. She, she was not yet, her, her thinking wasn't illuminated, right? She wasn't enlightened to the resurrection yet. And so she stands and she's weeping outside of the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb and verse 12 says she saw two angels in white sitting there with the, where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And I would think that like so many others who see angels in the Bible, she would fall down terrified or trying to worship these angels. But, but she's so caught up in, in Jesus that she, she's apathetic, and, and I think a beautiful way towards the angels. She's not impressed with them. She just wants Jesus, but she doesn't know what's going on. And so when they ask her, why are you weeping? She says to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She made this bad, false assumption. She jumped to conclusions in the beginning of, of John 20. And man, she took her wrong assumptions and ran with them. She ran and told the disciples, and now she's still running wild with them in her own thinking. And, and it's leading to her being filled with fear and filled with sorrow and, and drained of tears. They took him, and I don't know where they put him. Verse 14. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus. She saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And he said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
supposing him to be the gardener, leaping to another wrong conclusion and running with it. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. We'll, we'll, we'll pause right there. Again, Mary, she's in the dark. And I can relate to that. Sometimes I feel like I'm in the dark. Sometimes I feel like I can't see what's going on. Sometimes I'm looking for Jesus in a situation or scenario, and he seems like he's nowhere to be found. And I can run with that practically. I can run with that mentally and be filled with fear and be filled with sorrow. But I want to learn from, from Mary in this story. And instead of assuming the worst fearfully, I want to assume the best in faith. Because he lives, choose in faith to believe boldly. Again, I've investigated rationally and I have confidence and hope. I have the absolute expectation of good. Why? Because he lives, because he rose. And that can see me through a storm and enable me, enable me to make a decision or perhaps even an assumption of faith and hope in the true and living God. Believe boldly. Like Abraham, the father of faith. God promises him and his wife that, that they're going to conceive and have a miracle child, even though they're way too old for that. And that through this son of promise will come a nation of descendants, more in number than the stars in the sky. And it happens and they're thrilled and it's beautiful. But then God says, I want you to take Isaac and, and sacrifice him on the mountain. Remember that? And we're thinking, Abraham, don't do it, dude. <laughs> what, if you're, what if you're wrong? What if it was the, the, the matzah bread you ate or, or something? Like, like don't. Because if you do, then the promise of God to you will be broken. And your heart will be broken. But because he lives, because Abraham knows he serves the true and living God, he is able to make a decision not based on faulty assumptions that, that fill you with fear and, and, and fill you with sorrow and, 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 and prevent you from living into your, your calling. He's able to make a decision of faith and hope in the living God. And because he lives, Abraham was able to witness the living God swoop in for the save in the, in, in the nick of time. Stop. I've provided this, this ram in the thicket. Because he lives, Abraham could see him living and active in his life in a way that provided salvation. But Hebrews says that even if Abraham thought, even if I, I do kill him, God is faithful and will fulfill his promises. And it says that Abraham assumed that God, it says he supposed that, that God would just raise him from the dead. He believed and he believed boldly and it was reflected in his life. Romans 8, 28 says that all things work together for good. For those of us who love God and who are called by him, he is at work in our lives and he is working all things together for good. Abraham's life reflected a belief in that truth. Does mine, does yours. When we think of Esther, it's like, okay, well, well what about, I mean, that, that's the father of faith. That's kind of his MO, right, to, to live by faith. What about this young woman who's been thrust into this radical and terrible scenario that's outside of her control in so many ways? You expect her to risk her life, to go before the king and, and perhaps be put to death for, for taking this stand in faith? Esther would answer, 
Listen, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to make a decision of faith and hope in the living God. And because he lived, she was able to see him intercede in that whole narrative. And through her, her people are saved. We think about, okay, well, that's cool for Abraham and Esther. But what about Job? Remember Job? The worst happened. It's like, sweet, there was a ram in the thicket for, for, for Isaac. There was salvation for the Jews through the life of Esther. But Job was afflicted. Lightning struck. The worst happened. He lost his loved ones. He, he, he lost his health. He lost his wealth. He, he, the, the, like the worst case scenario happened. Even then, Job is faithful to God and he makes many decisions, a series of decisions of faith and hope in the living God. But, but Job, you should curse God and die. But, but Job, if this, is clearly not, this is clearly not working out for you. How are you still being faithful? How are you still trusting and hoping in God? In his own words, Job 19, 25, and 26, he would say, How? Because I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh, I shall see God. Because he lives. When, when you and me go through various trials, we can do what James says and count it all joy, James 1. Count it all joy with the decision of faith and hope in the living God. When we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience and, 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 and ultimately that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And like James, James says in, in chapter five, he says, consider Job, for you in 2024, in your scenario, when you're in the dark, when Jesus seems like he's nowhere to be found, like Job, where is God? Your life is hitting the fan hard. Well, well we, in these moments, we, we, we can stand on the truth that our Savior lives, that our Redeemer lives, like Job said, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And James says, take Job as an example of suffering and patience and see the end intended by it by the Lord. Don't just look at it like they did in verses one and five. Carefully examine it like Peter did in, 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 in verse six. And, and by God's grace, may you, may you see like John sees and, and perceives and understands in, in verse eight, the end intended by it, that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. He is alive and he is at work and he is working all things together for good for those of us who love him and are called by him. Because he lives, investigate rationally and believe boldly. Finally and briefly, because he lives, go promptly. Investigate rationally, believe boldly, go promptly. Mary was an example of what not to do in verses 11 through 15. But from 15 to verse 18, she's a shining example of what to do. Verse 15, again, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Note, first he says, Woman. He doesn't use her name. She doesn't know who he is. But then he calls her by name. And it clicks. She turned and said to him, 
in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And then verse 18 says, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And they had, that he had said these things to her. Now real quick, verse 17 is really troubling for a lot of people, and really confusing. Don't touch me. <laughs> Jesus says to her, don't cling to me. What's going on there? She's weeping. She's distraught. She's in the dark. But then the light bulb goes on. She has her own moment like John did where it clicks for him. Now it's clicking for, for Mary. This isn't a gardener. This is my teacher. This is Rabboni. This, this, is, this is him. It's Jesus. And, and the idea is that, that she just gives him a hug or, or perhaps kneels and, and clings to his feet. We're, we're not exactly sure. But, but she clings and, and she clings like... I lost you one time. I'm not going to lose you again. <laughs> That's the idea. I, I lost you. And for me, that, that's like I lost everything. And she's clinging to him. And, and, and I think he says this with a laugh. I can't prove that. But, but my suspicion is that Jesus is like, don't, hey, don't cling to me. Don't grasp on to me like you'll never see me again or like I might slip through your fingers and be gone forever. I'm in the process of ascending to my Father in heaven. I, I haven't yet ascended, but I am ascending. And, and, and you keep reading. In the next few paragraphs here, in, in John chapter 20, we're going to see that he's getting ready to give them the Holy Spirit. He, he knows, hey, you can let go. You don't have to hang on like you're never going to see me again. Go and tell the boys. I just had this whole discourse with them in the upper room before the whole crucifixion thing. And they were troubled because I was leaving and I, they, they can't go where I'm going because I'm ascending. But I, but I just gave this whole teaching to these guys about how I'm going to prepare a place for, me, for you and it's beneficial for you that I leave because I'm going to send my spirit to live within you. Jesus knew it was going to be okay, but he doesn't, he doesn't go into a lecture with her. Uh, he, go get these guys. I've been lecturing them. Uh, and, and, and you're about to discover that, that I'm not going to slip through your fingers. I am and will be with you even to the end of the age. Hayden, thank you. He's going to hit that switch to turn off that, that alarm. But that's, that's my indicator too to be like, wrap it up, kid. Jesus was with her and he would always remain with her so she could be at peace. She could be at rest. And instead of clinging on to Jesus like she was going to lose him forever, he gives her something else to put her hand to, so to speak. He sends her as the first messenger of the good news of Easter. Go and tell him. Go and tell him I'm ascending. Go and tell him I'm not dead. Go. Take the message. And in a simple way, as we land the plan and conclude this time in this place, I simply want to say, that just like that garden a couple thousand years ago, where people showed up in the dark without understanding, not knowing that he was alive and in their midst, living and moving among them with a mission for them, work to do through them. And then he called Mary personally by name. That same dynamic is and, and can be true for us today. There's things we don't understand for sure. 
but we can investigate rationally and conclude that Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. And, and, and we can believe boldly in the face of whatever comes our way. And we can be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and hear when he calls us by name in love and with salvation, but also with purpose. How might the Lord desire for you to see that he is alive and at work among us, among you and your scenario, your circle, your circumstances in life? Can you see it? Can you see how he's living and moving and working? I'd like to encourage you, because he lives, incline your ear to hear what, what mission he might have for you. Today, this week, this year, what does he want you to go and do? And when he calls you by name and gives you some sort of great commission, because he lives, go in obedience and go promptly. I'm so thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful that, that we can celebrate the truth of the gospel